You know, when it comes to certainty and conviction, we celebrate that God has invited us to draw near confidently, uh, to bring our requests and our prayers to him in faith that he hears and responds. And perhaps there's nowhere more clearly that we see a call to that kind of hope and that kind of certainty than in Psalm 23. And so I want us to, to move towards the Lord and worship by the hearing and, and responding to his word. So if you have a copy of scripture, open up Psalm 23, or maybe you've been like packing it away in your heart over the last few weeks. Maybe it's on a, a, an app on your phone. If, if not, it will be on the screen behind me. I know you are well seated, but you're going to get cold if you don't move, right? So I'm going to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word as we Turn to Psalm 23, seeking not just to hear, but be changed, not just to listen, but to encounter the God of the word. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows." Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we draw near to you, confidently we ask that by your spirit, your people may hear your word and live that we might draw near to you, our good shepherd, that you would meet us change us, and lead us. We ask it for the glory of Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So twice this past week, I had the pleasure of having meetings in sports bars. And like four weeks ago, they were like deserted. You know, you walk in, you sit down, you're the only one there, right? Uh, and this past week, I noticed something different. There was like joyful cheers, you know, like the kind of like celebration that would erupt spontaneously and totally like ruin your meeting and totally interrupt, right, your meal, All right? Something's happened this month that makes the sports bars a little different, right? Football. Football's broke back in. Yeah, I heard a woo. That was, I appreciated that. That was good. It made its way up here with the breeze. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, football broke in, and we, we, we are now in a season of this like COVID uncertainty where things that some of us have been looking forward to are finally able to experience and to experience joyfully like football, right? And, and it just makes me like want to ask you the question, what are you looking forward to? Like, what are you looking forward to? Maybe it's the mountains over fall break this week, right? Maybe it's camping, maybe it's a road trip, um, maybe it's, it's the beach next week, or, or maybe what you're looking forward to is that promotion that you were waiting on in January and it got set back a bit, right? Maybe you're waiting on the election, but you would be a few and far between. What are you looking forward to in this season? Like, what do you dream about, you know? What's that thing that brings a smile to your face? What are you looking forward to today? See, there's something that changes in us, right? Like changes in how we're living, changes in how we're walking and navigating this life when we are confidently looking forward to something with joy. What are you looking forward to? And we hear the good news of Psalm 23, break in verse 6. Surely, surely goodness. And mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And David has taken us on a journey through Psalm 23, journeying from green pastures and still waters where the sheep of the good shepherd hear the invitation to rest, to enjoy, to be restored and renewed. 
He, he's left the pasture land, and he's, he's traveling through various paths and even into deep and dark valleys where he declares that God is not only ever-present, but he's personal. He's personal. He protects and he guides. He never leaves. And is experiencing the goodness of the good shepherd, experiencing the presence of our great guide that causes him to celebrate with this word, surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, that's just like a word of confidence, right? So you could like take the word surely out and be like, I know, exclamation point, right? I know goodness and mercy will follow me. I can confidently say with great joy, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Confidence is one of those things that COVID stole. More than likely, you hit January, you made your list of resolutions. You're not going to call them resolutions just in case it don't happen, right? That's your like to-do list or maybe your life map for 2020. You had a plan. It was glorious, right? You want to start a business, right? You want to get that promotion, right? You want to finally ask her out, you know? You're going to change, you know, your profile picture on social media, hoping that'll fix everything, right? Good thing that was January before COVID because COVID-15 happened uh, for this one up here, right? So like you had a plan, you had this confidence. We always enter the new year with confidence and then COVID, and where we usually have confidence, it brought confusion. Where we usually have some like resemblance of control, it brought uncertainty. Surely, goodness and mercy. I'm wondering, as you think about that thing that you're looking forward to, if one of the, the kids over here or maybe a stranger to your left were to look to you and say, what is that thing that you look to confidently? What is that thing that you know for certain you will experience one day? What do you look to confidently? What are you certain about? Every, every Sunday as we've tried to steep into and like sink into Psalm 23, we've We've called you to consider how does this psalm meet us in this season? And I think the good news that we see today is even though, even though life is uncertain, even though life is uncertain, God's goodness is unchanging. Even though life's uncertain, God's goodness is unchanging. See, we are a people on this pilgrimage in an ever-changing world. We feel confident, we feel certain, and then things like COVID happen. We're wandering in that confusion and that fog. We're looking for something that we can rely on, something we can ground ourselves in anchor ourselves in, and we want to be a people who live in an ever-changing world, clinging to an unchanging God. That's one of the things I love about baptism. It's a celebration of what is certain, because life looks different. You navigate life differently when you look forward to something with certainty and joy. It is the ever-present weekend, and the Christian has the ability to navigate the uncertain world with the unchanging goodness of God always before us. Surely, he says, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, shall follow me. We've been running around like the backyard in the summer killing mosquitoes everywhere. We have a lot of water somehow hanging out, and all that happens is millions of mosquitoes get produced, right? So we're always like hitting our legs and trying to, to hit the, the mosquitoes that follow after us no matter where we go. And this, this word follow is usually like received that way. You know, it's like that thing I'm trying to get away from. But here in Psalm 23, it's, it's this confident peace 
this joy-filled hope, it simply means that no matter where I go, what season I enter, the goodness of God and the mercy of God will meet me there. It follows me. I can't get rid of it. As the psalmist says, no matter, even if I, if I stretch the whole ends of the earth, still you are with me. No matter what happens, I can't get away. God's goodness, God's mercy meet me there. This is the reason that the most repeated command in all of Scripture is simply, do not fear. Do not fear when life gets uncertain. Do not fear when you enter the fog. Do not fear when you're in the green pastures, the quiet waters, or in the valleys. For surely God's goodness and mercy will meet me. Even though life is uncertain, God's goodness is unchanging. And this changed how like the psalmist viewed what's next, you know? I, even now, some of us, months into the COVID season, are still struggling with what's next. For you, maybe it's the uncertainty of that promotion or the job. Like, you feel okay right now, but you're asking the question, like, what if, what if the winds change? What if, what if something happens? What if the, I'm watching the news and everything's uncertain? Like, what's next for my career? Maybe at school, you know, maybe you had plans in January. Everything got put on hold. Now you're questioning where you're going and what degree you're getting. What's next? Maybe it's your home. Maybe COVID has exposed, like, the fault lines in your family. Maybe everything feels like it's on shaky ground. Maybe you're unsure what you'll do if you get quarantined together again. What's next? Maybe it's children who've grown up and moved on, and you look at your life with your ever-expanding family, and you just can't see hope for any meaningful reconciliation. What's next? And for the psalmist, he answers the question of what's next with surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Even though life is uncertain, God's goodness is unchanging. And it's not just the what, what's next that it helps with, right? It's not just allowing us to peer into the future with this confident hope that God meets us there. It also helps us with the right now. And too many of us, we struggle with the right now. For us, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. We're always looking ahead, and we're missing the blessing that we have in the moment. This is how I live. I know some of you can, can join me in that. As the psalmist would say, listen, it's not just what's next that we have hope, and it's not just that his mercy and goodness will meet us one day. It's right now. Right now, and nowhere do we see this more clearly than verse 5. For he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, this is King David we're talking about, and David knew a lot of enemies. And throughout the Old Testament, we'll see, often see David running for his life. He'll be hiding in caves, you know, like eating bugs, right, waiting for that season to pass. Or we'll see him gathered with his mighty men or his army, and we'll see the enemy approach over, you know, walking over the hilltop as they look down on David and his small band of warriors. David knows enemies. Can you think of a more inconvenient time <laughs> when the enemy's approaching, when David is exhausted? when all his plans have miserably failed and he sees the army breach the top of the hill above him. Can you think of a more inconvenient time than for David to receive the invitation? Sit at the table. Pull up a chair. Feast and enjoy. 
See, what David is trying to tell us is that it's not just what's next that we have hope in. It's this confident joy that God's goodness and mercy will meet us then. It's right now. It's in this moment. There's a table before me, and the invitation is to pull up a chair. And I wonder, like in this season of your life, no matter where you're at, what your weeks look like, what is hindering you from sitting down at the table of God? Maybe it's the enemies. Maybe it's just busyness. Maybe you're just passing it by, hoping to get to what's next. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, there's one or two things happening here. We don't really know which is which. It depends on who you read. It could be that David is just joyfully showing us the rich ministry of hospitality. Uh, Throughout the scripture, the table is important. It's not the table that no one sits alone. There's always chairs around it, chairs for others. Community happens at the table. And the feast that David is talking about here is rare. They didn't have Costco, you know. They didn't walk in and just buy a bunch of ribeyes. Didn't happen. Only at certain times would they have more today than they needed. And when they had more than they needed, they would share it. It's time for celebration. They would throw the party, the dinner table. They would invite the neighbors, invite the friends, invite their family, pull up a chair, sit and enjoy. And whenever anyone would enter the home for the feast, the host would anoint their head with oil setting them apart as one who is honored. And as the dinner went on, the oil would move from the top of the forehead down, and the fragrance of the oil would allow them to rest in the heat of Palestine. David's reminding us that every host would prepare and set apart the best wine. And he says of his host, my glass is not half empty. (laughs) It's not just half full. It's overflowing. In this moment, my shepherd provides for me. Usually in Palestine, it's the servant who sets the table for the feast. I wonder if David knew that the good shepherd would serve in this way. He sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. God prepares the meal in the moment and spares no expense. It could also be that David is still taking us down the journey of a sheep who is led by the good shepherd. He has taken us from green pastures and still waters to the valley. After springtime, the shepherd in Palestine would lead the sheep up to the mesas that surround the valleys. As the sheep would approach the the top of the mesa, it would give way to this glorious pasture. It's cooler up there, high above where other animals travel, and there's no foot traffic for people. It's lush. They would delight in the summer harvest eat and gorge on the pastures before them. Mesa means table. And it's possible that David is still journeying with us through this annual pilgrimage of the sheep. He's like, listen, after the valleys, he leads us to the table. He leads us up the mesa to the, to the pasture land that is above the valley. And there we eat and we enjoy. And in the summertime, when the sheep would like graze on the grass, the heat would catch up. And then just like in Georgia, heat brings something, right? Bugs and flies and mosquitoes. And the flies that would attack the sheep, especially the ones uh, that embed themselves into their nose and their ears, would drive them crazy. And so in the summertime, a shepherd would grab oil and would smother the head of the sheep in oil, covering his, his nose and his ears so that he could enjoy the pasture without the pesky flies 
bothering him. After summer is fall and he journeys back down towards the pasture near the shepherd's home and as it gets cooler, <laughs> the shepherd would mix a special drink to warm the bodies of the sheep as they fight off the cold. My cup overflows. No matter whether David is talking about the feast or the mesas around the valleys in Palestine, What's clear is that no matter the situation or the season, the shepherd cares for his sheep. He cares for his sheep. So he begins in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall lack no good thing. And then he continues in verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Even though life is uncertain, God's goodness is unchanging. Are you experiencing the shepherd in this season? Leaning in to the one who leads, waiting on the one who guides, he ends his psalm in verse 6, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To dwell in the house simply means to be an honored host who lives in the presence of God forever. Are you experiencing life with the shepherd? Not just looking towards the one day, but experiencing him in the moment. Every Sunday we've tried to give you three action steps, three ways of leaning into the goodness of Psalm 23, three ways of practicing the presence of God. And so what does it look like this week? How, how can we confidently, joyfully look towards the word surely? How can we know what is to come as we follow the shepherd? Well, the first thing I want to call you to is to pull up a chair. Pull up a chair. No matter what you're going through, no matter what Monday looks like, no matter how things feel as we move towards November, pull up a chair and feast at the table of God. Hear his invitation. Are you anxious about what's next? Pull up a chair. Worried about what the next season holds? Pull up a chair. Feeling the uncertainty of the moment? Pull up a chair. Enjoying green pastures? Pull up a chair. Pull up a chair today. I love how the, the scripture, when it tells us to not fear, it roots the command in the unchanging character of God. Nowhere is this more clear than Revelation chapter 1. John sees what's next. He writes to the local church to let us know of the hope we have. And before he gets into like the meat of Revelation, he tells us what happens when he sees Christ face to face. We find it in chapter 1, verse 17. And John says this, When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. When I saw the Lord, the, the beauty and the majesty and the goodness of my God, I, it's as though I could not control myself, I just fell over. I fell at his feet as though I was dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, Do not fear, for I am the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the living one. I was dead. But now look, I'm alive, and I live forever and ever, and behold, I hold the keys of death and Hades. When the good shepherd tells us not to fear, he's speaking as one who is in control, one who offers us new life, one who can say, seek first the kingdom, because he holds the keys. So pull up a chair. Pull up a chair in the morning. We started a few weeks ago with the call to like pour your cup of coffee on purpose and then to steal the day with toasting. So in the morning, like 
pull up a chair to the, to the word of God, to the table of God, feast on his mercies. Lamentations tells us the steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Begin there. Before you turn on your phone and walk through social media and get stressed out again, like pull up a chair. Ask the Spirit of God to make his mercies new to you. And not just in the morning, but in the moment. This afternoon or this evening, Monday, <laughs> when you're in traffic or at work, wherever the moment finds you, receive from the one who serves. For the scripture calls us to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks in the moment. Pull up a chair. For surely, goodness and mercy will meet you there.